All right, welcome everyone. We're going to get started in just a minute here. Um, if you need any technical assistance today, um, you can look for the orange need help button. It should be in the bottom right hand corner of the attendee hub. Um, but again, we'll get started in just a second here. Your microphones have been muted. Um, but if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, you can find the Q&A feature in the virtual attendee hub, and we will try to get to your questions as we go. And we are actually at the top of the hour already. So welcome to another live virtual event hosted by Let's Move by United Healthcare. Um, Let's Move is here to keep your mind, body, and social life active with simple resources, tools, and fun events um, to help you explore ways to eat well, get fit, beat the blues, and stay connected. Today, we are excited to present the very first of a brand new nutrition education series. Um, again, hosted by Let's Move and Natalie Sessions. Natalie is a seasoned wellness dietitian um, and health coach. Her goal is to teach balanced eating without compromising taste and enjoyment. Today's topic is balanced eating for vitality, nutrition 101 for longevity. So again, if you need any technical assistance, look for that orange need help button that's going to be in the bottom corner of the attendee hub. If you have questions or comments, we will try to get to those. You can put them in the Q&A session. With that, I'm excited to hand it over to Natalie. Thank you so much. It is such a pleasure to join you all today. Thank you for having me. And I would love as we get started and kick things off before we dive in, I would love to know where you're joining from. So please share in, in the chat, in the in the hub there, uh, where you're joining from. We'd love to hear. I'm joining you from Texas, so very excited. And um, this topic we are exploring today is one of my all-time favorite topics. I'm very passionate about longevity and aging, and so... You may sense uh, my excitement around that as we get started. Um, so really quickly, just do need to share that um, the information I'm sharing today is for educational purposes only, so not intended to give anyone any personal advice um, or anything like that. So do need to share this disclaimer here that we are here for educational purpose purposes and um look forward to, to enlightening you here with some different information. So thank you again for joining us. So what our intention is in our time together today, we are going to talk about what are some of the known benefits of fueling wisely. We're going to really lay a foundation as we start the series off for this year about some eating basics. What are the essential nutrients that you need to promote longevity, healthy aging, and some lessons we uh, have learned in this realm of research from something called the blue zones, which maybe some of you are familiar with. And as time permits, we will definitely answer questions. So first off, we want, we do know a lot of different research has shown us that there are many potential benefits to focusing on fueling wisely. And you see a few listed here on, um, on the screen. So everything from supporting our brain health, our heart health, our digestion, our strength, our bones, our muscles, helping us as we get older to prevent injury and illnesses, you know, basically to enhance our immune system as much as we can through what we're eating. And also we see some strong research around the benefits we can attain around mental outlook and, and overall well-being. So many, many benefits there. I did want to mention too, you received a flyer. So if you haven't already accessed that, it'll have some key points and additional information from what we're covering today. So let's start, you know, uh, with the basics, I have just found in years of work with this that it's really important. This, for some of you, might be a review. For others of you, maybe this is the first time you're really learning kind of some nutrition 101. So we'll briefly take a snapshot here of essential nutrients and some, some principles. So we're all operating in the same framework. So Carbs, proteins, and fat are our three main 
macronutrients. So what that means in very ba basic terms is that the macros, we need them in relatively larger amounts versus our micronutrients, which are no less, uh, they are also essential, but we need them in relatively smaller amounts. And that would be your vitamins and your minerals, those categories of nutrients. So carbs, proteins, fats are macros. They do contain calories. That's what gives us energy, while the micronutrients do not um, really give us any viable amount of, of calories. So water I have listed here as well, because while technically water is not a nutrient per se, we know that hydration and getting adequate amounts of water is very vital. And we're going to look at more of this here in a moment. So that helps give the framework. I want to touch on each one of these briefly so that you have a very good understanding of what purpose each of these serve. So when it comes to carbohydrates, you see here that this is the primary fuel source for the body. When we eat food, we eat carbohydrates, that is giving our body energy primarily in the form of sugars. And you see, I have a little star here because I want to qualify what, because that term sugar is thrown around a lot, right? So when I'm saying sugars here, we're talking about carbohydrate molecules that are providing energy. These are broken down from the food we're eating that then ultimately give us the nutrients and, and energy. So there are two types of carbohydrates or sugars, if you will. We have simple and complex. Simple would be things like the type of carbs we get from things like fruit and also maybe from candies, for example. So not the same source, but the same type. We also have what's called complex carbohydrates that are things like grains and vegetables these often are going to contain a viable amount of fiber and other beneficial nutrients. And so I just briefly want to mention fiber here that it also offers us quite a bit of benefits. And so it's important to consider including fiber rich foods in your overall eating plan. Um, you see several examples of carbohydrate foods. So I want you to walk away from today knowing what type of foods are carbohydrates? So you see several examples there, vegetables, fruits, grains, breads, beans, legumes, uh, just to give you some examples there. Then we want to look at protein now. So the other macro protein, its main purpose is to build and repair the body's tissues. I mean, all of these nutrients do many things. We're hitting highlights today. So protein helps in regulating a lot of different cellular functions. And it too contributes to our overall energy along with carbohydrates. And again, it's really related to a structural support um, to cells. And then we draw upon it for energy when that's needed. So your primary protein foods include the ones you see here, different types of meats, animal proteins, poultry like chicken and turkey, fish, seafood, eggs are a protein as well, certain dairy foods, cottage cheese, for example, uh, provides a viable amount of protein. Tofu, if we're looking at plant-based proteins, tofu and edamame are great examples there. All right, so our third macronutrient is fat. And so any one of these nutrients sometimes gets, you know, it gets really confusing with what we learn out there. And fat, I know many years ago, um, got a bad rap, but fat is we're talking about today is a vital nutrient as well. It too helps to support cell cellular structure and function. It does things like help to regulate our body temperature and helps protect our organs. So we store uh, energy, in, in it's a storage form in there in fat. And so it is important that we are getting enough of each of these type of foods, including 
food sources. So here you see some healthier options for fat sources, avocado, olives, nuts, seeds, things like olive oil and cheese. Uh, I'll mention briefly here, not every food fits nice and neatly into carb protein fat categories. So dairy is the, an example of that. Uh, dairy is comprised, you know, cheese, for example, milk, dairy, cow's milk is unique in that it contains carb protein and fat, unless of course you're having a non-fat milk. So just want to be clear about that and set our stage for this Nutrition 101. If you do have questions, please share in the chat and we will try to get to those. So now let's talk about those micronutrients. So we have vitamins and minerals, as I mentioned in the beginning, these are needed in relatively lesser amounts, but they are still very important to our overall health and well-being. So they are going to do things like contribute, you know, and work together with the macronutrients to support um, our cell function, our growth, our overall function. They act as antioxidants. We'll talk about this more in some, some forthcoming classes. They also play a role in helping our body absorb some of the other nutrients. Then balancing things out here, we've got minerals as well, also very essential to the health and well being of our bodily functions, in particular around our bones, our muscles, our heart, our nervous system. They are um, important in helping the body produce certain enzymes that we need and hormones, again, all in an effort to help our body function as optimally as possible. All right. And then I mentioned how important water is. We could do a whole talk just on water today. We'll just touch on it briefly here. While technically it is not a nutrient, every cell in the brain and in the body depends on water in all of our body systems. So I can't emphasize this enough. It is a lubricant in a way for our joints and other body systems. And just overall, simply put, it helps to support the smooth functioning of our body and our brain and everything. All right, so I'm going to kind of pause here and check in. Do we have any questions or clarifications we need here um, that I need One to One question. Yes. Um, so you mentioned fiber, um, yes. and someone is curious about your view on the use of metam Metamucil as a fiber supplement, yes. um, and then also on synthetic sugars or sugar replacement, Blenda, aspartame. Okay, sure. Like so I'm going to briefly answer those. Those are great questions. I get those a lot. So dietary sub, so the Metamucil question, the fiber supplement. So technically that would be considered a dietary supplement, which uh, in fact is one of the topics of our upcoming classes this year. So I'll encourage you to visit us for that. But, but just in short, I would say dietary supplements have their time and place. So we may need to boost our fiber and perhaps for a variety of reasons, we're not able to get that through what we're eating. Ideally, we would get all the nutrients we need from our eating plan, from the foods we're eating. If it's deemed necessary in coordination, for example, with your healthcare provider that perhaps you do need a boost, and again, not able to get it through food, it could be appropriate. So it's going to vary from person to person. So on the question around, oh, remind me, what was the other question? Oh, the artificial yeah. sweeteners. Yes. Correct. So I would say short answer, there is very mixed opinions about this and somewhat um, debatable. In my work, in my opinion, it, it, the more I see research coming out, some research that even came out last year, I typically encourage people to avoid the artificial sweeteners. We just don't know enough about them. Again, everything we're talking about comes down to a personal choice, but I don't see really compelling enough uh, data to recommend them. 
So if I hope that's a short enough answer for now. Uh, we want to remember that those are chemicals. And so some would say, why put chemicals in our body when we don't have to? Uh, they also, for example, can trick the brain into thinking that it's going to get some energy, some calories, but those are zero calorie sweeteners. So it can be, it's associated with overeating sometimes because the body's wanting that energy. So those are just some two examples to share on that question. And I hope that helps. Okay. So I'd love to know if anyone is familiar and has heard of the blue zones. So if you're not familiar, these are longevity hotspots that various research, uh, a particular researcher um, has identified as areas where there are more centenarians, meaning people living to 100 and beyond, very vibrant lives. And so it's a very exciting area of research. What you see here are the geographic areas that have been identified as blue zones. So briefly here, we see in Okinawa, Japan, the longest live females. Um, in Sardinia, Italy, we see the longest living males, a high concentration of those. In Nicoya Peninsula of Costa Rica, we are seeing some of um, the lower rates of middle-aged mortality, for example, is what they've revealed in this research. In Ikaria, Greece, uh, we see it's a beautiful island with, again, lower rates of dementia, for example. And then in the U.S., we have a blue zone. Loma Linda, California um, is associated with, um, they have a high concentration of Seventh-day Adventists that are living um, some are living 10 more years than their, their uh, North American counterparts. And then more recently, very, as recently as last year, uh, as an engineered longevity hotspot, I'll explain that in a moment, we have Singapore. So um, I'm very, poor, you know, in Singapore, what they've done essentially in short there is they've created a special environment, a built environment, as it's referred to, to make the environment, make it easy for individuals to make healthy choices. So uh, very, very fascinating. I encourage you to research it more if this is something of interest to you. It's important to note there's no one thing or one magic a solution here, but what we have learned, some of what we have learned from the blue zones, what, what are the commonalities of these geographic areas that is contributing to their thriving longevity? So some keys we see from this research are that it's 95 across the board in these areas, 95 to 100% plant-based eating. So lots of leafy greens, lots of vegetables, beans, you know, that are native to those areas, lentils, some of the lean proteins we've mentioned already. Many of these areas are eating meat as a treat. So it's not the main show of the plate. And then you see nuts and olive oil there. Also that kind of rule, maybe many of you have heard of, or that guideline about eating in moderation, um, having a minimal amount of really sugary foods. So the ones where a lot of sweeteners are added in, they're just naturally sweet, like fruits, for example. And beyond the nutritional piece, we also see um, that these individuals are naturally physically active. They are doing their gardening. They are walking into town, going to meet up with their friends, for example. So they naturally um, are just moving more in their daily life. And that is contributing as well. They also have very strong social networks. And this is very key. There are some other commonalities um, that we won't be getting into today. Uh, but I encourage you again, if you're interested, there is some great, there are books and, and a new documentary and so forth about this, if, if you want to look into that. So I'd love to know what you what your thoughts are around the blue zones. I did want to go back really quickly and mention as far as eating in moderation, for example, there, what we mean by that in Okinawa, they have a mantra, a saying 
that is harahachibu. And what that means is eating only until you're about 80% full. So another way to think of that is just really being mindful, paying attention when you're eating and noticing when you first start to feel full. That would probably get you to that 80%. Um, and that can really help to be eating more mindfully in the present moment there. All right, so we touched on a lot today and I know we're moving very quickly. So just to kind of look at these key points that we're discussing today, what we've learned from Blue Zones and what we're learning from other research around aging and longevity is that the key is to get a variety. You know, many of us can get in a rut and we eat the same things over and over, but to really benefit, we want to aim for as much of a variety of wholesome foods as possible. Many of which we've touched on again with the carbs there, the vegetables, colorful array of different vegetables, maybe eating in season, for example, getting that broad spectrum of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, example, as well as varying up your proteins, just varying it up. It helps us to be less bored and it also gives us a much broader spectrum of nutrients. We have learned too that we wanna be mindful of really sugary sweets and things. It does not mean we can never have them, but we wanna think about that and be mindful as well as with alcohol. And then hydration, we've emphasized today as well. So great ways to stay hydrated are, of course, through water, um, through sparkling mineral water, for example. If, that, if you like the bubble, the effervescence there, that, that can count. Green tea and other herbal teas are also great ways to stay hydrated and contribute to our overall hydration. So this gives us a nice, broad overview. Some... So then you're like thinking maybe, how do I do this? You know, And so I would encourage you to think about if you're not already, you know, building balanced meals. And what I mean by that is at most of your meals, thinking about having some fiber rich carbohydrates, some protein and some fat. So if we can do that at most of our meals, that will can help us build that balance. And again, I've emphasized and we've mentioned about as much as possible, wholesome, unprocessed foods and being mindful of eating at irregular intervals, being consistent, not going too long to maintain our energy and support our nutrition, um, doing our best to have a regular type of eating pattern and paying attention to our hunger as well. It can be really beneficial. The research has shown us to eat with others. And so um, being social around the eating, we see that in the blue zones, we see that in, in other research as well, that when we're around people who have healthy habits, we also benefit and, and we see the benefit of just the social connection itself as well. And then I just encourage you, we're all on a different journey. We all have different challenges we may be facing with our health. And so getting the support you need through your various benefits, um, you know, maybe that is related to food shopping, meal prep, eating. And I, we do have on your flyer some additional resources you can explore um, for support that you may need on your own uh, eating journey, your own health journey. All right. So I want to encourage you to join us for more classes. These are the three immediate upcoming classes if you want to save these dates. And we would love to have you. We really appreciate you joining. And I'm excited. We have time for some Q&A. So if we have some more questions or information you want to share with me to address today, we do still have some time together. We do have a few great questions that came in. All right. Um, all right. So back to the macronutrients. Okay. How, how would you advise that someone determine how much of each macronutrient and same question for water mm -hmm. um, that someone might need for their current activity level for their stage of life? Yes. Great questions. So again, remember, we're not doing one-on-one -on -one advice here. Everyone's nutritional needs vary. It varies very much from person to person. 
That being said, I will say that a general rule of thumb is to aim for a third of each, kind of like the balanced plate I was talking about. So if overall at most of our meals, we're building those plates with a good proportion and portions of the carbs, the proteins, the fats we've talked about, not all are created equal. So again, depending on what your own health goals are, focusing on the ones that are going to support your health goals, like the examples we shared today. So I would say roughly a third, just to give you an answer to the question. But again, someone may need a little more protein and a little bit lesser percent of fat, for example, based on different health conditions or things of that nature. So again, I cannot emphasize enough that it does vary person to person. And so you could seek guidance from a dietitian um, and or other qualified, you know, health professional. I'm a little biased since I am a dietitian. We are food and nutrition experts. So that can be really helpful to understand your own individual needs is to work with, with someone like that for further guidance. And then with regard to water, that too will vary on a lot of different factors. It will vary on your age, on your activity level, as you mentioned, um, on the temperature outside or how active we're being. So one kind of rule of thumb there, I mean, you hear about the 64 ounce rule that may or may not be the amount you need. One way we can kind of check in with ourselves around hydration is to take a look when you are using the restroom and checking your urine output and going for that pale yellow. Unless you are on a medication or a supplement that is known to discolor your urine, then that can be a helpful indicator. If it's really bright yellow, it might be, oh, I need some more water. I mean, we haven't had enough water today because as we get older, our thirst mechanism diminishes, meaning that waiting until you're thirsty is not a good sign, you know, or not a good indicator. So we want to be proactive with our hydration. We want to maybe sip on it throughout the day, perhaps start your day with a glass of water and sip on it um, periodically throughout the day. And again, adjusting to if we have really hot temperature, we may need more. If we're doing a really intense workout, we're sweating a lot, we want to have more water before, during, and after that kind of a workout. I know that was a lot. Does that help? I hope that helps clarify for both of those questions. Yeah. Another question. Um, I Someone had heard that vegans typically don't get enough vitamin, vitamin B. Does this impact longevity or what are your thoughts on that? So B12 can be a nutrient of concern for someone who is vegan or even vegetarian, depending on the type of vegetarian. So that's another example where, again, I'm not blanketly going to say, you know, that you need to maybe supplement, but generally speaking, um, I would encourage you to coordinate with your healthcare provider, or again, a dietitian, someone like that, who a credentialed um, health professional that can assess if you are deficient in a particular nutrient, and especially if you are vegan, it may be very appropriate for you to consider a high quality B12 supplement because it is hard to get that um, in, in, a, in a vegan eating plan. So um, that may, may be definitely something to, to explore for you. And another question, would you consider vegetables ordered in restaurants nutritious? <laughs> depends on the restaurant and it depends how it's prepared. I mean, that could go for dining out or dining in at home. So yes, the way something is prepared does have an impact. So, you know, we'll talk about some of this in, in our forthcoming classes, but the cooking method does matter. For example, if we are boiling the broccoli or the Brussels sprouts until they completely lose their bright green, vibrant color, we have depleted some of the nutritional value there. Or if we have deep fried um, a vegetable, you know, we've added more fat and so forth. You know, we still might get some of that nutrition, you know, from the vegetable itself, but we've kind of maybe you know, X'd out some of that or, or, you know, compromised it in some way. So the cooking method does matter. So I would say go for, ask for steamed vegetables, 
um, maybe sauces and things on the side, if at all, so that you're more in control of, um, you know, don't be afraid to ask questions and, and ask how something's prepared so that you can decide, you know, if you want to ask or request some, some modifications. And last question, someone commented, I'm 76 from New Hampshire. Is it too late to move to Japan? Oh, <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, that's a question to consider for yourself. Um, you know, again, it's so dependent on your lifestyle. And I know social connection, I know we're talking about nutrition, but part of our nutrition in the broader sense is how we're nourishing ourselves socially. And so depending on what your social connections are, where you live now, and what is your social life, your social connection, your, your support circle, your support system look like if you were to relocate to another country? I mean, you definitely want to consider what are you giving up? What would you be potentially gaining? And how does that support your overall health goals? So look at the blue zones. Yeah, look in the blue zones. <laughs> see, um, it could be very exciting and very beneficial, but it just depends what's right for Great. you. Great. Well, um, we are at time. So I wanted to thank you, Natalie. Um, as a reminder, Natalie has dates for her upcoming nutrition sessions events on screen. Uh, but we do have some more events coming up, some more Let's Move events. Our next is a Move and Flow dance class that is this coming Tuesday at 2 Eastern. Um, we also have a virtual teaching kitchen that is on the 25th. The topic is build a better salad. That is at 4 Eastern. We have our next financial wellness seminar coming up um, February 7th. That is also at 4 Eastern. And then following that is Natalie's uh, Foods for Fueling Heart Health right after Valentine's Day on February 15th. I will put um, a link in the Q&A feature for you to sign up if you've not already registered for those events. Um, this class was recorded. We will be sharing the recording. So if you missed the beginning or if you wanted to go back and um, rewatch any segment of the session, you will be able to do that. We'll be sharing the recording as soon as it is ready. Um, but with that, I just want to thank you for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you.